Hello fabulous humans. Today we are going to be talking to uh, Sally Baxendale who is a consultant neuropsychologist at the University College London Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. Sally is that person who helps kind of um, assess and prep people for surgery and help them after surgery too because epilepsy surgery is not only well, and epilepsy itself is not only about seizures it's about the whole shebang that people go through that can be um, depression anxiety um, emotional instability etc so she helps assess and get people to be supported through the whole process um, and Sally's also going to be talking about her study into the impact of social media on people with epilepsy and actually what she's learnt from social media about people with epilepsy, which is really exciting. So if you're interested, stay tuned and make sure you subscribe to the channel by pressing subscribe and hit that bell for notifications. So thank you for joining us today, Sally. Could you please tell everybody a bit about yourself and what got you into the work that you do today? Okay, so I'm Sally Baxendale. I'm a consultant neurosurgeon psychologist. I work on the um, epilepsy surgery program at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery at Queen Square. Um, so my work is primarily um, focused on preparing patients for surgery and um, seeing whether surgery is a, a suitable option for them and then following them up afterwards and making sure that they can make the most of being seizure free afterwards. So a lot of people who come to see me the first time, um, it's quite unpleasant for them because I put them through loads of tests um, and we, we're kind of coming for a neuropsychological assessment is, I always say to people, it's a bit like having a scan. So when you have a scan, you can see which bits of the brain look right and which bits of the brain maybe don't look quite so right. And when you come to see me, I'm looking at which bits of the brain are working well and which bits of the brain aren't working quite so well. So we can kind of build up a pattern of strengths and weaknesses. And when we put that together with the scan, we can work out maybe where the epilepsy is coming from and what will happen if we take out that bit of the brain that's causing the epilepsy. So that's one bit of my work. And then the other bit of my work is um, to do with um, diagnosing epilepsy and people who are um, unsure of the diagnosis, so sometimes um, they come into the Chalfont Centre um, to work out what's happening because they may have been given a diagnosis of epilepsy but the medication's not working and people aren't sure whether it is epilepsy or not. So we do lots and lots of tests to make sure that they get the right diagnosis because some things look like epilepsy but they're not. Um, it, they've got different different basis. So it might be non-epileptic attacks or it might be something something different again. So I work with people with very bad epilepsy and also people who've just had one or two seizures. And I work with people from 17 to 95, so right across the adult when you say, um When you say people with very bad epilepsy, do you not sometimes think, though, that um, what is bad epilepsy to one person is not bad to another person? It's about perception. Absolutely. So that's a really, really good point. So um, bad epilepsy for... It's different for every person. So some people cope with it remarkably well and just, you know, they, 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 they just, it doesn't seem to have much impact on their life. They're able to, to, to cope with all, all, everything that comes with that diagnosis. But other people, objectively, they may have fewer seizures or they may not injure themselves in seizures, but for them, the devastation on their life is absolutely huge. So how bad somebody's epilepsy is, is not just how often they have seizures or how um, how prolonged those seizures are when they have them or the injuries that they sustain when they have those seizures. It's very much how much it's impacting on that person's life. And that's really only for them to say. Um, so as as the clinical team, we'll, we're, we've got all sorts of scales that we use to, to measure frequency of seizures and severity of seizures. But how, you're right, how bad some, how bad epilepsy is, only that person will be able to say. And that can depend upon so many things, right? Like how it impacts them psychologically, how it impacts them socially, can come down to things like, you know, even, you know, how, how people at church or the mosque might treat you depends, you know, on, on so many, uh, so many factors, I think. And can it be quite hard to identify, take all those things into account and then analyze them and figure out how can we minimize these awful feelings 
there were so many so many different facets to the being given a diagnosis of epilepsy and living with it the the diagnosis of epilepsy is quite unusual in that it's just based on seizures the presence of seizures um, but actually what's happening when you when you have a diagnosis of epilepsy is that there's something something gone a little bit amiss in the brain so the brain is creating seizures but also that that whatever that abnormality is can have all sorts of other impacts as well so it may mean that you're more likely to have low mood it may mean that you're more likely to become anxious due to that abnormality not just the impact of living with epilepsy that abnormality itself can be driving some of those mental health issues and then we have to set that that diagnosis as you say in the social context so what do people around you know about epilepsy? What do they think about epilepsy? What, what's their knowledge? Do they have all sorts of misconceptions about it? There's a piece of research that we did quite a few years ago now, but we were just looking at myths about epilepsy and how prevalent they were out in society. So we, we um, put a questionnaire up on the internet and we got about 4,000 responses. So we got a lot of people, we put some myths up there and said, you know, if you see someone with epilepsy, should you put something in their mouth to stop them choking and things like that. And about a third of people still think it's a good idea to stick things in people's mouths. Um, we said, do, do, do people always foam at the mouth when they have a seizure? And quite a few people think, yes, you know, if you're going to have a seizure, you will be foaming at the mouth. Um, but all sorts of myths are still out there. And worryingly, um, certainly in some cultures, there's still a huge um, supernatural um, element to epilepsy. So from, within some cultures, it's still believed to be um, associated with some sort of possession and things like that. So it very much depends on where you are in the world um, and where you are within your particular culture as to the societal baggage that comes with that. So, yeah. Baggage is a really good word for it, actually, because that's what it feels like. You're carrying weights. Like, actually, I, I made this one comment once ages ago when I, I was ex trying to explain to somebody what it could be like to have a tonic-clonic seizure, especially a bad one. And I said it was like running the London Marathon 20 times whilst carrying a million weights on you. That's how exhausted you can feel afterwards. But I think lots of people almost feel that every day with the societal impact of things um, and the rejection that they can feel. And it's not limited to countries which are, one might call, you know, lower to middle income countries stereotypically. It happens here in the UK, it happens in the States, it happens in Australia, Canada, but people don't talk about it. I think anything that people don't understand yeah. um, is tends to generate kind of fear and people don't want to have anything to do with it as a, as a rule and one of, the, one of the big problems with epilepsy is that the one thing that if you say to somebody oh I've got epilepsy I say oh flashing lights oh, no. you've, got to, you've got to stay away from flashing lights so it's a tiny proportion of people with epilepsy their seizures are triggered by flashing lights and it's astonishing that this really small percentage of people within a kind of condition it's the one thing that everybody knows it's about. Isn't it weird? And everything else that comes, you know, 98% of everything else that comes with epilepsy, people don't recognise. So they, they don't, they don't, certainly don't recognise focal seizures. Um, they don't see that as epilepsy. Um, and we've, I mean, certainly um, in, in, over the course of my career, I've seen some really bad things happen to people when they've had focal seizures in public places and people have not recognised this epilepsy. So we had one one man who, um, his arm kind of went out and he cleared a, a shelf in, in um, I think it was in Marks and Spencers and all the stuff. And of course the security guards were all called over and, and then he kind of perceived, because it was a, a frontal seizure, he kind of perceived that as a bit of a threat and became um, quite combative and, and you know, that, that, that no, if somebody had recognised this man is having a seizure, we need to clear the space, we need to just be with him until it stops, then it would have had a very, very different outcome. But he ended up being handcuffed and taken off. Um, so there's, there's some awful things that happen because, just because people don't know, they don't recognise. There's um, a chap I know who does have post-ictal aggression and people just think he's, well, just aggressive. 
I was like, no, just give him some space. Please give him some space. Um, and I can relate to it personally, actually. I, I don't get aggressive, but I hate anyone touching me. I just hate it. And so if I'm having focal aware or, or focal um, lack of awareness, don't touch me, dude. I, so I said this like to my partner. I just, it's like being really, it's like some creepy person coming over you. It's like, do get off, you know. Um, and, and it's, but isn't it amazing how p different people feel about, about, about epilepsy and their different experiences as a person with it. And actually I was speaking to one uh, amazing person called um, Gavin um, a few weeks ago um, who researches epilepsy and he was saying, it's amazing there aren't more people with epilepsy, really. When I do my teaching mm -hmm. on brain development and some of the abnormalities of brain development that can lead you to a propensity to have seizures, you, it's so complex, the brain, and you just think, how does it go right so many times? I mean, it, it's just, it's absolutely astonishing, yeah. Just quickly back to um, your uh, research into a person's uh, thoughts on um, S surgery success or lack thereof. Um, I've often thought that a lot of how people feel afterwards in terms of success can be influenced by what they expected. So if you, so for instance, when I had my surgery, I knew that there was a 60% chance of poten potentially of not having any more seizures, but because I knew there's a 40% chance that I would still have seizures, I'm like, okay, cool, let's just like do it. It's worth that risk. For blah, blah, blah. And I consider my surgery a complete success, despite me not being angle class one. Um, so it's, despite me still having seizures sometimes, but it's a complete and utter success. But I know that, you know, some people wouldn't classify it as such, but isn't that a lot of that down to um, expectations? Yep, you really hit the nail on the head. So one of the things that we really try and focus on at Queen Square is looking at people's expectations prior to surgery. So what are they expecting to get from this? Because the only thing that surgery can do, the only thing that can do is reduce seizures or take seizures away. It doesn't change the fact that you've lived all your life with seizures. It doesn't change the impact that that's had on your life and your relationships and your career and everything else. That, that all, that's all the same. Um, and if there are other features um, that are getting in the way of you really being able to maximize your potential, then those will still be there after the surgery. So managing expectations for surgery is really, really important. And it's really important to look at what people expect will happen if they don't have seizures. Because as I said, the only thing that surgery can do is take the seizures away. They can't, it can't, if you're lucky, if you, as, 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 like you say, there's the, the, the best odds that we give people are 70%. So even, even in the best kind of scenario, there's one in three that won't be made seizure free. You may have a significant improvement, but we've really got to look at what are you expecting to happen if you don't have seizures, because it won't automatically happen. Um, and it may need some work and it may need some, some thought about how to make that happen. Um, so yeah, it, preparing people for surgery is really, really important. And the study that we've just done looking at satisfaction in surgery, um, or satisfaction with outcomes following surgery, particularly psychosocial outcomes, so the impact on your ability to um, sort of live your life to the fullest really, looks at anxiety. And we found that patients who were an anxious beforehand um, they aren't as satisfied afterwards, even if they're completely seizure free. Um, they're not as satisfied with the outcome because they're still living with anxiety. And maybe some of the things that they attributed to the epilepsy weren't the epilepsy, but was actually the anxiety and that anxiety is still there. So we can use that information to work with people before they have surgery to give them techniques to manage their anxiety. Um, to, to really, really address that as, as an issue. So they're going into surgery in the best possible state um, and can capitalize on any, any improvements in, in seizures. That, that and you were saying in our chat before that epilepsy isn't just seizures, right? It comes with so many, well, and, and like you're also saying, oh, they're classified as comorbidities, but actually, are they? Aren't these just part of the epilepsy? Well, I mean, they are, but they're not comorbidities because they're actually manifestations of the same underlying abnormality that causes the seizures. 
So you've got that abnormality that sometimes causes seizures, but will cause memory problems every single day, or will cause a a, um, a low mood or a, a propensity towards low mood. Um, and that's part of that same abnormality. So we hone in on the seizures and say, ah, you've got epilepsy. And we say, all well, these other things are comorbidities, but they're not. They're part of that same underlying abnormality. So if the patients were diagnosed with the brain abnormality, for example, some, some people with epilepsy may have hippocampal sclerosis. If you were diagnosed with hippocampal sclerosis, then you would say, okay, well, what does that mean? It means you may have seizures. It means you may have memory problems. It means you may have a, um, you may be more likely to develop low mood at points. So that would be a kind of list of things that come with that pathology. But we just focus on those seizures, and sometimes those other things can be forgotten. Certainly by the medic. I mean, they're not forgotten by the people who suffer with them because they're, they're there every day. Um, but by the clinical team, sometimes they get less attention, and that's kind of my job really is to make sure they. They don't get forgotten. We totally we need more people like you, um, Sally. I, I speak to so many patients and families who they see they're lucky enough to see a neurologist or even an epileptologist, but there's often not any referral unless seizures uh, sorry unless um, surgery is considered to um, a neuropsychiatrist or you know um, anybody who can help them with their mental health. And it's like. The, it, you know, it makes me think of you know that that game Jenga, and you pull something out. I think a lot of the time you pull out like a couple of those bricks if you don't consider a person's mental health. Uh, you know, all the on one side, all the seizures could be, for instance, controlled, but if your mental health or uh, you know other comorbidities are not, then you are going to fall over. This is something that the Nice um, Committee have been looking at this, um, and I think it is going to be. Rec recognised um, in terms of, you know, these are the needs of this population. We, we've got to be looking at more than just seizures. So hopefully, I mean, it, it's very difficult. The NHS is under immense strain at the moment um, for all sorts of reasons. But, you know, it, I, th I think it, having it recognised by NICE as this is important and this needs to be looked at is the first stage in getting more of me more more of the kind of newer psychologists out there who who are you know just dedicated to, to this these kind of things well we would certainly approve more of you, <laughs> more of you <laughs> we want more of you and to mums and dads carers you know even having more people like you would improve you know the, the experience for employers you know and the general public it absolutely would it absolutely would and 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 I mean, particularly, I've, I've got a real thing about um, schools, um, working with schools and working within the education system, actually, right from the very beginning, because that's where we need to start. If we are going to educate people about epilepsy, if we start in the schools and right at the very beginning, all the kids know, so there will probably be one person with epilepsy in every single school, just just. I mean, just statistically, that's very, very likely. So if every other pupil knew about the condition, knew that it was nothing to be scared of, knew what to do when somebody had a seizure, knew how to recognise a seizure, immediately we would have a whole generation of people who've got, who don't grow up with that um, kind of stigmatising, scary, fearful, ignorant approach to this condition. Um, so I'm really, really passionate about getting into schools really telling people about it, destigmatizing it. It's one of those things, you know, and, and, and also if they know that that kid's got epilepsy, then, then they can be looking out for them. Um, they also know that they're just like all the other children. You know, they're not something different, special or anything else. They're just like everybody else. Um, so I think that is the way forward. Um, but to do that, we need, you know, some specialists to, to really get in there and, and work on it. Yeah, that. you're making me think of like, a lot of um, children, well, and adults, particularly children, have asthma, don't they? So if you have a kid have an asthma attack, you will have people, you know, parents or the kid t tell everyone what to do if that's going to happen, even if it's more than the inhaler or whatever. Let's do the same with epilepsy. So so the, the asthma, they've done it, diabetes, they've done it. Um, you know, there are... Other other models out there where it's just just one of those things. Oh yeah, so and so is diabetic, and this is what we do if we, we see it getting a bit you know just low in sugar or whatever. So that it, it can be done, and, and I think it needs to be done in epilepsy. Um, and, and within a you know within a generation, within ten ten years, you've got a whole group of people who've come up 
who know what they're doing. And for those of us who are past school age and are supposed adults, you know, okay, we might not be benefiting directly from that, but isn't that uplifting to see the next generation who are not going to go through many of the things that many of us have gone through? Um, it's just a lovely, lovely thing to focus on. The other, the other thing is that older people learn from young people. So, you know, young, it's young people that tend to drive the changes in attitude in society. And then eventually, you know, the old people are a bit stuck in their ways, but they kind of come around in the end. And that's how it works. So I think that's, that's the way yeah. to go. People, people listening, watching, please be open to contradiction. We, you don't always know how everything works, certainly us included. And sometimes through better understandings and um, which come about through, through research and listening to people, that well, that's how we we develop better understandings of things. Can better care for people and just get people to chill out a bit more when something happens that's unexpected. Well, again, if, if people understand what's happening, they will be a bit more chilled out when they've got not a clue what's happening. Um, that's when they get fearful, and that's when you get overreaction. Yeah, I mean, we can have more people be um, open at work things like that. And also be more confident, I think, to ask questions of your neuropsychologist and of your neurologist and realise that you're not the only person who may have problems with their memory. These are the, you know, and actually the more open you are about these things, the more you find other people who have similar issues, but they might not have epilepsy. They, you know, it's like, I, I, I don't know. I can't think of an example now because of memory, but. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. So, so I wrote a book a while ago um, really, for it came from my clinical practice working with people with epilepsy, and it was called Coping with Memory Problems. And it was really just to explain how memory works, why it can go wrong, and just some of the strategies that you can use to get around the nuisance that it causes in everyday life. So we can't um, make memory better, but what we can do is just find workarounds so that it's not impacting on on what you're up to. And like I say, I wrote it really for people with epilepsy, but it's been taken up by all sorts of people who've got memory problems um, just in their everyday life. Um, and they eventually got onto a books on prescription scheme so that you can prescribe the book um, for anyone who's complaining about their memory. So it's not, yeah, you know, people with epilepsy are not alone in some of these problems. And you're absolutely right. If you talk about them, um, people will say, oh my goodness, I have that. And it's much easier, I find, to talk about something if you understand it a bit more yourself. So, and that might require a bit of reading. It might, you know, require somebody having the strength to actually ask the questions, first of all. It's like, there's no such thing as a bad question. It's like being open and learning about things can positively affect culture, can affect people completely different backgrounds who don't have any type of medical condition as well. I think that's why sort of podcasts like this are quite useful because if you see um, that these are really common problems and that you know it's certainly something that I see a lot in, in terms of memory, in terms of, of low mood, in terms of anxiety, all of those things are really, really common and it's, you know, you are not alone and talk to your doctors about them um, because there is help out there um, and they do, they may, they may not bring it up spontaneously, but it is understood to be part of the condition. Yeah, and I think sometimes it's okay to ask for things. So I went to an appointment and I spoke to my neurologist and I said, just mate, I'm, I'm not gonna cope. I, I swear, a tonic clonic is on its way, even though I hadn't had one in ages, because if this isn't this, I was so anxious, I was so tired, and there's, there are so many you know, things contributing. And um, I'm really worried about my memory. I'm just, it's just so upsetting. And so I very luckily got, was able to be referred to a um, neuropsychiatrist. And we shouldn't have to, you know, ask these questions. But if you do desire help from something, don't think it's automatically not epilepsy, right? It can be totally related mm -hmm. to it. And so it ask is. for help, I say. One of the other studies that we've done is looking at um, what people with epilepsy say on social media right. about their consultations with mm. their doctors. Um, because quite often doctors will give you a, I mean, if they're, if they're doing an audit of their service, they'll sort of ring up the top five patients that they know will say nice things <laughs> and say, are you happy? And they'll say, yes, I'm very happy. And, and then they say, oh, it's a great service. But actually, if you look on social media, you get a very different picture of what patients really think when they leave the doctor's office. And we found that, um, the, so people will kind of post, some very witty memes about it and the things that 
um, really resonate with the number of likes and the number of shares and things like that are uh, doctors using big words when really they don't need to. So they'll say idiopathic cryptogenic <laughs> when actually they mean we don't know. Yep. Um, they will just give you way too much information. Um, so there's a lovely meme of a, of a mouse with an enormous kind of berry in its mouth. And it says, you know, me leave, trying to leave the doctor's office with everything that they've kind of given me to, to remember. Um, so we give people too much information. We don't use the right language when we're talking to people. Um, and also just the preparation of um, kind of giving giving results. So, you know, if, particularly if you're giving negative results, that some, some people leave just thinking, well, what now? You know, so, so they'll go through a whole batch of tests and say, well, I haven't found anything, don't know, bye. And then, you know, the, the person's just left there with, well, I've still, still got this problem, so what's the next, you know, what are we going to do? So that was really, really helpful, looking at social media and looking to see what people really think about there. And, and by looking at that, we can now change our kind of practice. So what I always do um, at the beginning of my assessments is um, say to people, I'm going to write to you with everything that I've said. So don't sit there thinking you've got to remember it all because I'm going to, and I, I reiterate that I say that at the beginning and then when they're leaving, I say it again. So they can actually just relax and sit and listen as opposed to, I've got to remember everything, there's too much, too much coming at me and then they don't remember anything at all. So, oh, that, Do you know what, that's even giving me right, right now, a, uh, I can feel my chest go, <sighs> because you're always worried that you're going to have to remember everything and also you're worried yeah. that you're going to forget something that you wanted to bring up as well that's really interesting because that's the other the other meme that got loads and loads of likes this was this is this kind of character pulling its hair out it's just like me leaving the doctor's office when i re remember everything i wish i'd said so again what we try to put in our um, appointment letters now is if there's something you'd like to bring up bring a little list we may not be able to get through everything but write it down Bring it with you. The doctor won't mind about that. It helps the consultation. Um, and then that just makes sure that you get across what you need to get across. We get across what we need to get across. And it's all written down and it's not that load on your memory. Um, which, you know, when people are coming to talk to you about their memory problems, you know, we need, we need to be addressing yeah. that. And it's a two-way relationship, isn't it? Between the doctor or the nurse um, or both and the patient and often carers as well. Um, and I think that seeing it in, in this, I mean, it shouldn't be, but it's kind of like a, I don't know, it's more of a recent thing, isn't it? People used to be like, oh, I praise the clinician and you can tell me anything and I'll just keep quiet. And I think that still exists a bit. Um, and we need to be looking at this in a different way, as I said, this two-way or sometimes three-way relationship so that we can achieve the best outcomes, which is really more satisfying for the doctors and nurses and consultants, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it, it is a collaboration because there's certain things I know about memory and epilepsy, but I don't know as much as the person sitting in front of me who's telling me what their everyday problem is. They are the expert in how it is impacting on their life. I can help them with some ideas as to how we can get around some of those problems. So it's got to be uh, both of you coming at it together and working together. It's not um, you know, somebody just imposing, well, this is what you need to do at all. It's got to be a two-way thing. And you, you mentioned a few times families. And I think family work is so important as well, not just with young people. So I think some of the best bits of work I've done is when I've worked with um, couples and, and kind of explained to the partner of somebody with epilepsy why it is that they don't always remember something. And what the, the partner can do to help with that as opposed to just getting really frustrated and saying but I told you this and I told you this and it can cause real friction in a relationship because they say well they just don't listen to me it's like it's not that they're not listening it's because it doesn't go in the first time and you've got to kind of work with that and certainly you can sort of see the penny dropping sometimes relief on the part of the person with epilepsy because somebody's actually explaining and kind of like the, the partner's like oh okay it's part of that condition it's not just that they're they don't care yeah it's not that they're not listening to me and it's not that they're, they're lazy or it's not that they're always yeah. distracted or, or it's not yeah. that i'm not important yeah. to them 
it's yeah. something else yeah. and so yeah. yeah and like you say I think that can be really good for relationships and even sometimes um speaking from personal experience for professional relationships so um I've said to people I've worked with in the past that like, please don't be offended like I might not remember something first time but that's why I write everything down and I go through my notes later and then so it is extra work and it is like <laughs> like frustrating and like oh should I have to do this da, da, da. but it's empowering long term and you can sometimes develop skills as a result of that and like, I, I found in the past people would come to me right, Tori what was said because I know you've got notes on it but you're taking the mickey in aren't you but here's the answer da, 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 da. and it can really make you part of a team you know of course I'm assuming people are in work and stuff that's for those people and, and something that I do say to a lot of the sort of younger so younger sort of people in their 30s and 40s when they're developing the memory strategies to organize their lives they're kind of stealing a march on the people who will need these strategies when they're 50 and 60 um, they will already have them all in place and they will know about you know how to how to set everything up and they will have it all set up because eventually you know we all kind of suffer from memory problems so um, yeah. um just quickly back just um quick moment to um the social media side did you notice anything particularly negative about social media that might that we could potentially use as a bit of a warning for people because i um i can't say i'm always a massive fan of social media even though i'm on it all the time for, for work obviously but there are some negative aspects to it the things that that really worry me about social media um is the kind of uninformed advice so somebody will say something like you know i've just been put on this particular drug um i'm i'm experiencing some side effect of some sort and then you will get all sorts of other people just offering their opinion of what that person should do so sometimes they will say um, oh you need to stop the medication immediately well that's not a good idea sometimes they say oh if you take this extra medication that will address it and it might be something complementary or it may not you know you don't know what they're offering so there's lots of uninformed well you've got no idea who's who's advising you when you when you just throw that out there so sometimes it might be quite good advice um i think probably the only advice that is useful in that <clears throat> kind of situation is go and talk to your doctor um but quite often people say oh well when i had this i did this and it's not going to be the same for everybody so the advice side of things is scary um the other thing on social media and this is a remarkable kind of development really is that it's now in epilepsy it has been classified as a uh, assault with a deadly weapon if somebody sends flashing lights uh, a sort of oh, I've had somebody send video. that to me before and, I, and it made me really angry because I'm thinking of people who would be affected but I was also kind of laughing at them you're pathetic like three percent of people I'm not affected dude so you loser but it is very of course dangerous it, it is very dangerous and it's so some um, trolls kind of got into an epilepsy mailing list and just sent it to everybody a uh, kind of attachment with flashing lights but in the states it's been prosecuted as assault with a Good. deadly weapon if you knowingly send it to somebody with epilepsy so um, it, it'll be interesting to see how that goes and I have to say the the UK government have been really good in responding to this because they used to be all sorts of um, videos that you could just Google and attach and now if you if you try and search for kind of flashing lights uh, you can't find it they, they've taken them down um, so that they they've responded really well to that is it a crime in, in the UK now to them? not yet not not here not here I don't think not not yet um, I think at the moment they're just trying to stop people get, getting access to it but in the States it's going through as a kind of test case somebody deliberately sent it to somebody that they knew had epilepsy and that person had a generalized uh, seizure as a result of wow. opening the attachment so it's, it's uh, yeah um well i think globally or, or people from all countries listening let's see if our governments have, have got this in mind and they are actually pushing it to be criminalized it'll be interesting to see how it how it fits in because there's a, an online harms bill that's currently going through um, so it may it may feature that I don't know. Is there a particular note you'd like us to finish on, Sally? Like, what should people do if they are seeking, for instance, um, help with their mental health and their epilepsy combined? Go and talk to your neurologist um, and ask for a referral. Um, hopefully, 
You may get to see somebody who's got um, expertise in epilepsy and will understand how these all of these conditions kind of interact and, and how they're related to each other. Um, I think that's probably the best thing. There are some um, patient groups and advocacy groups um, that may be able to provide some support. There's lots of these kinds of things online. So some of these podcasts, um, they are very, very useful. The Epilepsy Society also has a helpline. Um, they may be able to help Epilepsy Action, maybe also be able to help. Um, so there are lots of organizations out there. But the first port of call would be going to see your doctor, who hopefully will be able to put you in contact with some um, mental health uh, professionals who, who know what they're talking about. And, and how about our clinicians that are listening, they're interested more in this, what should they do? Like, I guess, reach out to yourself? Or? We do have a, a UK epilepsy neuropsychology group um, of uh, experts who work in, in this field. And we kind of, we, we've not been able to meet that much over the kind of COVID pandemic but um, we, we are a kind of group of people who try and share information and when we you know whenever we kind of come across a, a good paper or something we'll post it to the group um, so there are some 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 um, networks out there um, and if people want to join us they're more than welcome to just contact right. me and I think the International League Against Epilepsy as well is, is focusing more and more on psychiatric comorbidities. It's got a real focus on comorbidities. It's got a real focus on um, a lot of, the, lot of the, the problems around seizures. So obviously they're very focused on seizures as well, but they are really, really broadening kind of the... Uh, and and there, there's all sorts of different task groups that are looking at this and looking to produce guidelines and uh, best practice consensus statements and things like that. So always look at the International League website. That, that's a really useful And this is, really is you know what, this is making me think of as well. Gosh, I could go talk to you forever. It's so interesting. But that is people who are nonverbal, for instance, or have severe intellectual disability, who and who we know often do have psychiatric comorbidities, just like loads of us, but can struggle to communicate how they feel. And that is... We need to be standing. Yeah, up for and, them and, too. and you know, certainly with 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 people like that, you, it's being aware. It's the clinician needs to be aware of of um kind of what may be going on. And often the um the the carers, the parents, they are very in tune, so they know there's a change. They know that you know, and, and the the clinician may think, well, it's pretty much the same as it was last time I saw him. But listen to the the carers because they they will tell you. There's been a change. He's not as alert. He's not as reactive, responsive, um, and it may well be a mood issue there. So it's it, we really need to talk to the, the people who know these individuals because they're very in tune with changes. Thank you so much for joining us, Sally. It's been so so interesting, and I, for ages, as I mentioned to you before, I just so appreciate the work that you're doing. Pleasure. <laughs>